All right, so we've been moving through psychrometric applications. It's the study of moist air. We were introduced to the concept of dry air. I think most of us are already familiar with dry air. It's air without any water vapor, but air is made up of multiple components, but we consider it as one entity dry air for many engineering calculations. So that once we had the concept of dry air, then we had the concept of saturated air. That's where the air has the maximum amount of water vapor that it can hold. At that point, the partial pressure of the vapor in the air equals the saturation pressure at that temperature. It's saturated. And then moist air is anywhere in between, dry air and saturated air. We had the dry bulb temperature as well as the dew point temperature. I think you have most experience with the dry bulb, but you also have a lot of experience with the dew point temperature. So if I have uh, the temperature of the air drops to the dew point or below the dew point, water will coalesce and the droplets and the influence of gravity settle out. And you often see dew on the grass, dew on your cars, dew on surfaces early in the morning uh, because it, the temperature of the air dropped overnight. And hit and went to the dew point temperature or less. Likewise, we see examples of dew point temperature when we bring in cold surfaces into a warm, humid room, uh, maybe a cold beverage container, and then it sweats the outside. Well, what's happening is that cold surface is lower than the dew point temperature of the air in the room, and, or off your glasses, if you bring in cold glasses from the outside into the warm interior of a house in the middle of winter. So outside they're cold, you walk inside, they fog up. That's because the temperature of the glass is less than the dew point temperature of the air in the room. When the dew point temperature is 25 degrees C or 77 degrees F, what is the percentage of moist air, uh, what percent of the moist air is vapor? So we want to calculate the percent of the moist air that's vapor. So we think about the amount that's vapor and the amount that's vapor plus the amount that's dry air. That's what we want to calculate. If you want to calculate it per unit volume, per unit volume, per unit volume, then it's a density of the vapor divided by the density of the vapor plus the density of the dry air. And we would use ideal gas equation that this would be the partial pressure of the vapor, molar mass of the vapor, divided by R bar T. And likewise, partial pressure of the dry air, molar mass of the dry air, divided by R bar T. And we cancel all the R bar T's, and we're left with putting in the, part, the pressure of the vapor, well, what is the dew point temperature? When, when the dew point temperature is 25, that tells us that the um, the partial pressure of the vapor is the saturation pressure at that dew point temperature of 25. So that's 3.170 kilopascal. Then you had the molar mass of the vapor, 18.02. I'll leave the units off of that. Uh, 3.170, 18.02, plus the partial pressure of the dry air. At this point, you have to make an assumption. We'll say the total pressure is 101.3 kilopascal. So it's 101.3 minus 3.170 times the molar mass of dry air, 28.97. And this comes right at 2%. So we find that when you do have moist air, maybe you can characterize it by a dew point temperature, 25 degrees C, uh, you can get a, a lot of the mass that's in the moist air is vapor. Here's the plot of increasing dew point temperature. Here I've shifted degrees F. Uh, what we just calculated was around t a temperature of what, 77 degrees F? 
what was the previous problem? Uh, 77 degrees F, 25 degrees C. We calculated that the mass fraction of vapor in the moist air was right at 2%. Well, if you do that, you find as the dew point temperature decreases, there's less water. Or as the dew point temperature increases, there's more water. So the mass fraction of vapor in the moist air goes up or down. A uh, lot of people will quote, uh, describe the air and say how comfortable it is for an individual. Um, if the dew point temperature is less than around 55 degrees F, the mass fraction of vapor is low and it's very pleasant. For most people would describe it as pleasant. And yet it can become uncomfortable to getting sticky, to uncomfortable, to oppressive, to miserable as the dew point temperature increases, which is increasing amount of water vapor in it. I think a lot of us have experience with that, being in a room and it's, it's just sticky or uncomfortable because of humidity. The other device or other temperature that we wanted to talk about is the wet bulb temperature. So there's three temperatures, the dry bulb, the dew point, the wet bulb. And how do we measure the wet bulb? Well, uh, you use a sling psychrometer, as shown here. So we would take and buy a handle, and we'd have two bulbs, a wet bulb kept wet by a wick, uh, like a cotton sock, a wicking material that is damp. And there's possibly a reservoir where the water would come to keep it wet. And then you'd have a dry thermometer, so it's the dry bulb. You would sling it around in the room and it would come into thermal equilibrium after you slung it around for a few minutes and the wet bulb temperature would be lower than the dry bulb temperature indicating that there's been some evaporation off of that sock, off of that wet bulb and that evaporation comes at some heat so the temperature drops uh, it comes to an equilibrium where there's convection heat transfer to keep the wet bulb warm because the temperature of the air around it is greater than the temperature of the wet bulb. So there's convection heat transfer to keep it warm, but then that feeds the evaporation. So it takes energy to evaporate off that wet bulb. And so I brought a sling psychrometer. This is the model that I brought. And Basically, it slides out, and I'll pass it around, and you can line it up to, to make it go back together. All right, so it has a, a dry bulb on one side and a wet bulb, and if you unscrew the cap, which I screwed down tightly, you'll see a reservoir that I filled with a little bit of water. It's, it's, the water is all in the wicking material. So the wick is damp, and you can see it's damp, and then you would take it and sling it. And the instructions for this uh, uh, sling psychrometer are such that it says you remove the cap, fill it with water, replace the cap, uh, make sure that the wick covers the wet bulb and the other one is dry, uh, and then uh, pull the body from the tube, uh, sling it around for about one and a half minutes, and then read the wet bulb and read the dry bulb. Uh, reinsert the uh, thermometer into on two sides it has a calibrated scales line up the wet bulb temperature with the dry bulb temperature and when it does when it lines up then read off the relative humidity so that's what you, what you would, what you do to use this device so um, these devices are still out there in practice although they're pretty much been replaced with electronics. Some instrument technician can bring something in and digitally read out the dry bulb and the relative humidity and the wet bulb uh, from uh, electronics. So in this room, it's right at 65 and about 72. So if I insert that, I have to line it up. And then I look on either side, one is a higher temperature and one is a lower temperature side. 
So I, the wet bulb was 65 and the dry bulb is 72, bringing a humidity of whoo, quite high. Uh, maybe I didn't sling it around lo long enough, but it's uh, around 65% relative humidity. Anybody? Has anybody ever seen one of those? No? They're pretty inexpensive and uh, they're out there. People do still use them. So if you call, if you have an office on campus and you call over to the facility services people and say, my room is uncomfortable, uh, they'll come out there and first they'll read the temperature in the room. <laughs> they'll say whether or not it's in the range of what it should be. But if it's sticky or you're complaining about not the temperature so much as the uncomfortableness, they'll bring out a sling psychrometer and check the humidity. Well, this is a good lead into two humidities that we need to be com comfortable with. We have three temperatures. There's going to be two humidities. The first is the relative humidity. This textbook uses that symbol phi. And it's defined as the ratio of the partial pressure of the vapor in the moist air divided by the maximum that it could be, the saturation pressure. So this is their symbol in this textbook for the saturation pressure. The saturation pressure, where will we get it? Right out of the steam tables. And it depends on the temperature, the dry bulb temperature of that moist air. Okay, so when the partial pressure uh, goes up, this PV can go between zero and PSAT. When it's at PSAT, you're at 100% relative humidity. When it's zero, you have dry air. Anywhere in between, you have moist air. Get in that, uh, you could have 50%, 60% relative humidity. How do we often use this equation? We often unravel it. We say the partial pressure of the vapor in the moist air is equal to the relative humidity times the saturation pressure, or I'll say PSAT instead of PG, the saturation pressure. A lot of, you, I encourage you to go ahead and look in an encyclopedia uh, as well as the textbook. Sometimes uh, you use RH instead of phi for relative humidity. It's the ratio of that partial pressure of the water vapor to the equilibrium vapor pressure of water at the same temperature, the saturation pressure. And it depends on the temperature and pressure of the system of interest. Calculate the partial pressure of water vapor and moist air when it's 1 atm, 26 degrees C, and 60% relative humidity. Well, you would say, okay, let's go ahead and list things so we know the total pressure, 1 atm or 101.3 kilopascal. Okay. We know that the dry bulb temperature is 26 degrees C. True? And we know the relative humidity is 60%. So what are we asked to find? The partial pressure of the water vapor. We're asked to calculate PV. How would we do it? Well, we would recall the definition of relative humidity and unravel. So it's phi times PSAT. But that saturation pressure depends on what temperature? It depends on the dry bulb temperature in the room. And the dry bulb temperature is 26. So we go and look for that saturation pressure. In our table here, I copied some numbers. And so there is the saturation pressure. So the partial pressure of the water vapor is 60% of 3.364 kilopascal. That would be the answer. All right. The other humidity is called humidity ratio. So we have two humidities the relative humidity and the humidity ratio. Well, this one is a symbol omega. What is the definition of the humidity ratio? Well, it's the ratio of how much mass of vapor per mass of dry air. So it, 
it has a, maybe a kilograms of vapor per kilogram dry air if you're looking at the units. So really it's dimensionless, but it is a kilogram over kilogram, but it's a kilogram of vapor divided by the kilogram of dry air. Um, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll say the mass of the vapor divided by the volume that the vapor occupies in the saturated air or the moist air mixture, and the mass of dry air divided by the volume. So this becomes the density of vapor divided by the density of the dry air. Okay. Notice this. Is that the mass of saturated air or let's say moist air? Or is that the mass of dry air? This, this M sub A is the mass of dry air. It's per kilogram of dry air. It's not per kilogram of the moist air mixture. Okay? So that's why I, a lot of times, um, will put uh, a different subscript than used in the book. I will say omega is equal to the omega of the vapor divided by, not the omega, the mass of the vapor divided by the mass of the DA emphasizing it's the dry air. Okay. Show that the humidity ratio, omega, can be expressed as this equation, which is 0.622 times the ratio of PV over P minus PV. Well, first of all, what are the units on omega? Well, it was kilogram per kilogram, so it's really dimensionless. If we look over onto the right-hand side, it's a constant with no dimension shown times the ratio of pressure over delta pressure. So this is dimensionless as well, isn't it? So it's, it's all dimensionless. Um, we don't recognize 0.622 unless you've seen this equation before. If you're new to it, you're saying, well, where did 6.622 come from? And we'll show that in a minute. But uh, what is this PV, just to remind ourselves, it's the, the vapor pressure that the vapor exerts. It can be between zero, dry air, and saturation pressure, 100% relative humidity. It can, PV is between PSAT and zero, somewhere in between. Okay. Uh, what is P in this equation? The total pressure the atmospheric pressure. So typically P is around 100 kilopascal, right? And a lot of times if I wanted to calculate PV, if I was given the relative humidity, I would multiply the relative humidity by P sat and that would give me the partial pressure of the water vapor. True? So we, we understand each of the terms now PV, PV, the same thing as in the numerator and denominator. P is the total pressure, and 0.622 is going to be a ratio okay, of molecular masses. Let's go ahead now and start the, to, to show this is true. So we start with the basic, well, it's the mass of vapor divided by the mass of the dry air. Well, we can put that per unit volume, so we're talking density. And now we're talking the density of vapor, but I know how to calculate the density of vapor using the ideal gas equation, isn't it? Can, can I say that that's the partial pressure of the vapor times the molar mass of the vapor divided by R bar T? Likewise for the dry air, the partial pressure of the dry air, the molar mass of the dry air divided by R bar T. So we can cancel the R bars and the T's and what we're left with is the molar mass of the vapor divided by the molar mass of the dry air times the partial pressure of the vapor divided by the partial pressure of the dry air. Well, we recall the total pressure is the sum of the dry air partial pressure and the vapor partial pressure. So we're going to replace that by PV divided by P minus PV. And then this ratio of the molar mass of vapor, 18.02, divided by the molar mass of dry air, uh, 28.97.
and that gives us 0 0.622. Now, if you have a calculator, you'll see that there's some extra change on that. But this is one of these things where this equation's not quoted to four or five si significant digits on that constant. It's just quoted to 3.622. So when you see that, so when you see that constant, 0.622, it's simply the ratio of the molar mass water vapor divided by dry air. So there you go. Calculate the humidity ratio, so we're asked to find omega for the moist air at a pressure of 1 atm, temperature 26 degrees C, and 60% relative humidity. Well, we probably use the equation that we just shown, 0.622, or rederive it, times the partial pressure of the vapor, the total pressure minus the partial pressure of the vapor. To use this equation, what I really need is the partial pressure of the vapor. How would I calculate the partial? Well, I'd use the relative humidity times the saturation pressure at that dry bulb temperature. So we find that the dry bulb temperature is 26. So there is our PSAT, so it's 0 .60, 60% relative humidity, 3.364 kilopascals. So we get our PV for this problem. Um, and, and then we would substitute that into this equation right here. So it would be um, 0.622. Uh, 0.6 times 3.364, 101.3 minus 0.6 times 3.364. And what do we calculate? Somebody have a calculator? Want to run that for me? What do we calculate for that? 0, 0.0 something, 0 0.01264, and that's kilograms of vapor per kilogram of dry air. At first, you look at this and say, that doesn't look like as intuitive of a property or as helpful of a property, this, this humidity ratio, but it's the one that mechanical engineers love the best, <laughs> that we use a lot when we study um, conditioning of air. So we're heating air, we're cooling air, okay? And I'll describe why, but it's because the mass flow rate of dry air doesn't go up or down typically. We may divide it, we may split it, we may add streams, but there is not a mechanism where we um, condense or vaporize dry air. But water, water, when we flow through uh, air conditioning systems, it, it can condense on a cool surface, on a cooling coil, and we may want to add some water and humidify, so we may spray in some liquid water or some other uh, steam into uh, a stream of air to make it more humid. So water is always being added and, and removed in air conditioning applications. The room air is at 30 degrees C, which is around 86 degrees F, uh, 97 kilopascal, 60% <coughs> relative humidity. Determine the partial pressure of the dry air. Well, that should be pretty easy. How do we calculate the partial pressure of the dry air? Yeah, relative humidity times the saturation pressure at this 30 degrees C. So that saturation pressure is used right there. How about the humidity ratio? 0.622 PV over P minus PV. <coughs> True? All right. How about the dew point temperature? How do I calculate the dew point temperature? We play a thought experiment where you cool the gas or the cool the moist air until it reaches a state that the temperature um, is so low that it's now 100% relative humidity. It's, it's saturated air. So we cool it at constant pressure. 
If we're cooling it at constant pressure, then that stays constant. And what about the partial pressure of the dry air? That stays constant as well during this thought process of cooling it. So the partial pressure of the vapor stays constant as well. The total pressure stays constant. The partial pressure of the dry air stays constant. Hence, the, in, the, in our thought process as we're cooling it, the partial pressure of the vapor stays constant. But what happens is, is it reaches a point where it's now 100% relative humidity. So PV after cooling it in our thought experiment is equal to 100% times the saturation pressure, not at the original dry bulb temperature, but at the dew point temperature. It's at, at that new dew point, that lower conceptual dew point temperature. So um, when we solve for part A, we found that the uh, partial pressure of the dry air is uh, 94.45 kilopascal, and the partial pressure of the vapor, right here, piece of V, uh, was um, 2.5. Uh, 5476 kilopascal. Hence, we want to find where the saturation pressure is equal to 2.5476 kilopascal with a relative humidity of 100%. So we look down and we find that, oh, this falls right in this range, doesn't it? 2.5476 kilopascal is in between. And so the dew point temperature is going to be between 21 and 22 degrees C. And I do some linear interpolation, and we calculate the dew point temperature to be 21.4 degrees C. We have a lot of experience physically with dew point temperature and moisture coming out of air on our glasses, surfaces of cars, grass, cold beverages in warm rooms. But we, working with it computationally is a little more challenging. So you just have to um, really sit through and think through what we just did to calculate that temperature of 21.4. So if I had a room, it would need to be cooled from 30 all the way down to 21.4 before it hit where it's saturated air. And before, if I tried to cool it any lower, it's going to do out. It's going to do out. So, so there you go. Okay. Now, what is the mass of the water vapor in a volume of one cubic meter? Well, the mass would be the mass density of the vapor times that volume. True? So the mass density, can we use the ideal gas equation? The partial pressure of the vapor, uh, the molar mass of the vapor divided by R bar T. Sure. And then multiply by the one cubic meter volume. And so um, you calculate that the mass of the vapor that's in one cubic meter is 0 0.0182 kilograms. I didn't have a part E, so that's the answer of part D. And I should have given the answer for part uh, a is right here, partial pressure of the dry air. And the humidity ratio, did I give it? I don't think I did. Omega is equal to 0 0.0168. All right? Yeah. Go back to the 30 degrees C. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now let's talk about air balances and water balances. Often we have an air stream and it comes in at state one and it goes out at state two. Maybe we pass it over a hot surface, a heating coil. Heating coil. So heating is easier than the other is if I have a duct and it comes in at state one and it goes out at state two, 
but this time I have a cooling coil. So what's the purpose of the cooling coil is to drop the dry bulb temperature to cool off the airstream. The heating coil is to heat it up. So we would say, oh, the temperature exiting is going to be greater than the temperature entering of that moist air. This is some airstream. And likewise, for the cooling coil, the temperature at 2 is less than the inlet temperature at 1. Well, we're going to be interested in doing air balances and water balances. So we'll introduce a little control volume. And notice that control volume uh, is at 1. The surface cuts at 1 here on the inlet and 2 at the exit. And for air balance, it seems pretty straightforward. The mass flow rate of air coming in, dry air coming in, we're going to consider dry air balance and then a water balance. That's coming in at 1. Is there any addition of nitrogen and oxygen or what we call dry air in the system anywhere? No. It's just one in, one out. So the mass flow rate of dry air going out so we would just drop the subscripts and we would just say that's equal to a constant. Just talk about the mass flow rate of dry air through the system. That's our dry air balance. How about for water? Well, we would talk about the mass flow rate of vapor because it's all vapor coming in. And as far as I know, it's all vapor going out. But how would I represent the vapor coming in? Could I represent it as humidity? ratio inlet times the mass flow rate of dry air. Think about that, right? Omega 1, what was the definition? Kilograms of vapor per kilogram of dry air. So it's, we represent the mass flow rate of vapor as the product of humidity ratio 1 times the mass flow rate of dry air. How about going out? Omega 2 times m dot dry air. If it's a heating coil, there's no moisture being added. Omega-1 is equal to omega-2. True? But let's say it's the middle of winter. It's up north, New York, Chicago. They have a problem because uh, the buildings get very dry for long winter. Okay? So in the buildings, they actually add humidity. How do they add humidity to the air? Well, they'll have a little coil come in and they'll just spray in water. They'll either spray in liquid water or they'll actually spray in steam, depending on the application. If they spray in liquid water, then the amount of heat added by the heating coil is going to be higher. If they spray in steam, the amount of heat added by the heating coil is lower to get it up to the same outlet temperature and same humidity. So. Let's do it if I'm bringing in a mass flow rate of some liquid coming in to this control volume because of a humidification it's spraying in some water. Well, we would add over here the mass flow rate of the liquid being added, wouldn't we, in our water balance? Well, so we can see that the mass flow rate of liquid, if we have any being added, will be the difference between the outlet humidity ratio, the inlet humidity ratio, and the mass flow rate of the dry air going through. So there's a, a water balance applicable for a heating application. Now let's think about cooling coils. Remember our A coil and an evaporator and air conditioning system? What did we have to have? A drip system, a collection for moisture, didn't we? So often they'll show it like this. They'll have a little pan and a little drain. What are they taking? Off of that cooling coil, they're taking mass flow rate of liquid condensate, m dot liquid. So when we do the balance, the water balance, we have that omega 1 times mass flow rate of dry air equal to the mass flow rate of liquid condensate going out plus omega 2 times the mass flow rate of dry air. The equations look very similar. It's just now the mass flow rate of liquid condensate being removed is equal to the mass flow rate of dry air times omega 1 minus omega 2. It comes in more humid 
in the air conditioning or cooling coil application. And typically it comes in uh, or goes out more humid in the heating where you have humidification going on. Those make sense? Mass balances. That's why engineers, we like to use omega. What is omega again? Humidity ratio. It's kind of funny units, true? What were the units on omega? Kilogram of vapor per kilogram of dry air. Okay. Moist air at 25 degrees C, 100 kilopascals, 75% relative humidity, flows over a cooling coil with a dry air flow rate of 2.5 kilograms per second. So let's go ahead and make our sketch. We'll have a cooling coil. Put a little drip pan on the bottom of that cooling coil. And then we go out. And so the moist air comes in at uh, 25 degrees C. There's three temperatures. 25 degrees C is that dry bulb, wet bulb, or dew point? Dry bulb. Unless you're told anything else. 25 degrees C, it's the dry bulb. And then the pressure of 100 kilopascal and relative humidity of 75%. All right. And also the mass flow rate of dry air is 2.5 kilograms per second. The air leaves at a temperature of 12 degrees C. So the dry bulb's been reduced. It's a lot lower dry bulb temperature. And the relative humidity is 95%. So it's a much higher humidity. Now at first you might think, well, did it get cold enough to actually condense some of the moisture out of the air? And you would think, well, if it did condense some of the moisture out of the air, how come phi 2 isn't 100%? Well, Typically what happens is some of the air flows and it's in intimate contact with the cold surface. Some of the air flows between the two fins of the coil and isn't so intimate in contact with the cold surface. So some of it does get up to 100% relative humidity, does condense out some moisture as, as, as it continues to be cooled. Some doesn't. But then afterwards they mix again and so often you'll have something that's not 100% relative humidity coming off a cooling coil, even though you have some liquid condensate coming off that cooling coil. All right. Determine the volumetric flow rate of air entering the coil. So what do we want to calculate? AV inlet. Well, would that be the mass flow rate of dry air coming in the, uh, multiplied by or divided by however you want to do it. If you want to divide by the mass density of dry air or mass flow rate of dry air times the specific volume of dry air. Either one works, right? So um, I know the mass flow rate of dry air do I know or can I calculate either the density or specific volume of dry air? Yeah, we use the gas equation, ideal gas equation. So uh, let's do it rho of dry air. That would be the partial pressure of the dry air, molar mass of dry air, divided by R bar T. Okay. What is the partial pressure of the dry air? That's the total pressure minus the vapor pressure. What is the vapor pressure? Well, it's 75% of the saturation pressure at uh, 25 degrees C. So there's a few steps to calculate it. All right. So um, the the uh, the uh, saturation pressure, let me kind of put in some numbers here, is around 3.17 kilopascal. And the total pressure was 100 kilopascal, so the dry bulb, <coughs> I'm sorry, the dry air partial pressure comes in at 97.6 right, 
kilopascal, there's some more digits and you keep more digits in intermediate calculations when I'm uh, showing you some of these values. The, the density, um, actually I calculated the reciprocal, 0 0.8760 meters cubed per kilogram of dry air. And then we calculate the, the mass flow rate or the volumetric flow rate inlet of dry air. Actually, it's, it's the volumetric flow rate of all the air. It's a 2.19 meters cubed per second, which is 131 meters cubed per minute. So that's the volumetric flow rate of air entering the coil. Now, I'll just pause a little bit. This meters cubed, it's the volume but both dry air and water vapor occupy that same volume. There's not a distinction of this is the volumetric flow rate only of dry air or the volumetric flow rate only of the water vapor. Okay, so part B. What is the condensate flow rate leaving the coil? So I'm trying to find this mass flow rate of the liquid. Well, we do a water balance isn't that going to be the mass flow rate of the dry air times omega 1 minus omega 2, difference in humidity ratios? So I have to calculate the omega 1. So I go and I say, well, omega 1 is 0.622 times the partial pressure of the vapor initial at 1 divided by the partial pressure of the dry air at 1. And we calculate that to be 0 0.01515. Omega 2, similarly, 0 0.622, the partial pressure of the vapor at 2, divided by the partial pressure of the dry air at 2. And it comes in at 0 0.004, I'm sorry, 8840. So I try to line these up so you can compare them. So it's high larger omega-1 than omega-2. Okay. <clears throat> so when you calculate the mass flow rate of the liquid condensate that will be draining off that cooling coil, you calculate it to be 0 0.0169 kilograms per second, or it's 1.01 kilogram per minute. Um, if somebody has a water bottle, how many of those water bottles per minute is going to be draining off of that cooling coil? Kilogram occupies of water, liquid water, it occupies one liter, right? Uh, one liter. So if you have a little um, 500 milliliter water bottle, you get two of those per minute. That water bottle looks like it's a lot more, isn't it? How big is that water bottle? A liter. Oh, it's a, a full liter? Mm -hmm. Okay. So up to the mark where it's showing full, that's how much water you would get per minute. Um, the UTSA, if you talk to Renee, who's going to be helping with the tours, he's the senior person help setting up the tour, he talks, he, you can ask him questions about water reclamation off of cooling coils and buildings to help um, feed the water that is being lost in our, uh, our pools and other outdoor water, uh, like under the Sombria, what do they call that? But if there's always, a, if they're running that, it's evaporating, so where do they get the water from? They're trying to reclaim some of the water out of the buildings in the summer off of the uh, condensate off the coils and then pipe it over there. You don't want to drink it, but it may supplement the evaporation in some of the water fountains on campus. And have you ever seen one where they have a little tag, this is shut off to help conserve water? <laughs> so, there you go. Did you have a question? Yeah, um 
That's right. The total pressure here and the total pressure there remains 100 kilopascal. That's right. So P2 is 100 kilopascal. Now, in a real system, if you're pushing air through a duct, there's going to be some pressure loss uh, because of friction, but it would be very small. The total pressure, 100 kilopascal. Somebody else have a comment or question? Whoops. Well, I think we're pretty much out of time. Next time we have to talk about energy balances, okay? And we do an energy balance for this moist air problems.